Good afternoon and uh, welcome to CSIS on what has to be the most dreary day that we've had here in, in November. So uh, uh, thank you for your fortitude and your you know, sense of adventure in, in venturing out today. Uh, my name is Stephanie Sanic Castro. Uh, until recently, I was the acting director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program here at CSIS. And I wanna welcome you to our event today on achieving disaster resilience in US communities. Uh, hopefully uh, several of you have picked up some of copies of the report that were available downstairs. If not, we can make them available to you um, on your way out or online at CSIS.org. Uh, just rules of the road, if you wouldn't mind setting your uh, personal devices to silent or stun, I would appreciate it. Um, they do in fact uh, uh, disagree with our uh, AV system here, so I would ask you to do that. So the issue of disaster resilience is one that we here at CSIS have taken a great interest in for the last few years. I know a number of you here today have attended some of our past events and discussions on the topic as part of our Disaster Resilience Series, generously sponsored by the Irene W. and C.B. Pennington Foundation of Baton Rouge. For any of you who are interested in the series, again, I re reference you to the, or refer you to the website CSIS.org for both videos and expert interviews. Over the last decade, we have witnessed the increased frequency and severity of natural disasters throughout the United States and around the world, the rising economic losses, the mounting costs of providing relief, with far-reaching consequences that range from loss of life, loss of property, psychological and economic damage. It's clear that merely throwing money at the problem in the aftermath, immediately after a disaster, constitutes a wildly insufficient approach. Rather, here at CSI, as we've uh, been exploring how to approach this issue set from a different perspective, one that draws on the full spectrum of public and private sector stakeholders, that emphasizes risk mitigation, and puts into place key elements in advance of a disaster in order to strengthen community, re community resilience. Today's event marks the completion of our most recent study of natural disasters and community and resilience. Before I talk about the report, our findings, and our recommendations, I'd like to briefly introduce our two guests who are seated on the dais to my right. I really could not have asked for two better, more knowledgeable, and visionary individuals to discuss the roles of public and private organizations, areas for potential reform, and the need for ongoing dialogue. I will uh, introduce them briefly to you, and then summarize the report, and then turn the floor over to them. Speaking first uh, uh, after me would be Ms. Robin Barnes, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Greater New Orleans Incorporated, which is a regional economic development alliance serving the 10 parish region of Southeast Louisiana. Her organization pursues an aggressive agenda of business and product development, improving regional business conditions through policy, workforce, and research initiatives. Ms. Barnes was also a key advisor on the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force and has been active in the philanthropic space for decades. Mr. Bob Ottendorf, sorry, Ottenhoff, is president and CEO of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, a nonprofit organization located a scant block away from here, dedicated to transforming disaster by incre disaster given by increasing donor effectiveness throughout the life cycle of disasters through educational opportunities and strategic guidance. Bob is a veteran in philanthropy, nonprofit leadership, and entrepreneurship, having served at GuideStar, an industry leader in using data to help donors make better decisions and improve nonprofit practice, and he served at PBS for nine years as chief operating officer. I'll turn to these experts for their thoughts after I quickly summarize our CSIS report. The report presents 12 key findings and associated recommendations that have resulted from nearly two years of our research. Our study team conducted a near exhaustive literature review and interviewed scores of subject matter experts in the public and private sectors. In August of last year, we released a white paper and a video that was narrated by former Senator and Chair of the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, Joe Lieberman, that teed up the issues we addressed in the report. In the interest of time, I'll refer you to the report, in particular the executive summary, wherein you'll find a table that maps uh, and crosswalks the 12 key findings along with our recommendations. We have five categories of recommendations and I'll just cover them briefly now. The first has to do with the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA. This category um, of recommendations talks about identifying and standardizing impact measurements for threat and hazard identification and risk assessments and after action reports, and develops targets and performance metrics for key capabilities. We recommend the department should further involve stakeholders in developing those metrics and make available more data and analysis. 
In particular, FEMA's Emergency Business Operations Center should create a national database of information on all relevant state regulations and host a web portal for verified entities to update and exchange information. The second category of recommendation deals with federal executive branch agencies, and we argue that they should advocate for pre- and post-disaster mitigation grants to receive additional preparedness and response assistance funding. Excuse me as I'm, um, let me just grab some water real quick. So the house I live in was built in 1900. Just so you know, radiation, radiator, radiation heat, radiator heat, uh, completely drying, and then we come here um, to CSI. So I apologize for the frog in my throat. <clears throat> so we were talking a little bit about federal executive branch agencies and what they can do. In addition to talking about mitigation grants, we argue that we, they should create a framework for waivers, for regulatory and other requirements. And we can talk a little bit about that during the Q&A session uh, in terms of what kinds of uh, waivers they should grant. The third category of recommendation hinges on state and local governments and what they can do to help uh, community resilience. For example, exploring available options to transfer risk to federal government, which really should be a welcome uh, recommendation for state and local governments, and to prepare memorandums of understanding to improve flexibility in credentialing and, again, waivers. They should also work within public and private partnerships to detail responsibilities and guarantee protections. The fourth category is what, if anything, will get CSIS into hot water, and that is our category where we talk about what Congress can do. Um, I am a former uh, professional staff member on a, a congressional committee, and I know that if this crossed my desk, I, I'd kind of look askance, but hopefully uh, CSIS can bring enough weight uh, to this discussion for them to actually ask us about what we mean when we say Congress should pursue scalability of response and recovery assistance evaluate programs critically, authorized FEMA private pilot programs that have improved efficiency. Congress should also improve funding flexibility of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, continue to explore ways to improve insurance and reinsurance mechanisms, limit availability of assistance to all uninsured infrastructure within special flood hazard areas, and re-examine thresholds for private sector liability. Our fifth and final category of recommendations deals with public-private partnerships and continuing research and development efforts on exploiting crowdsourced data for better, better situational awareness, examining other methods of mitigation promotion, such as incentivizing continuity of operations planning with low interest loans, exploring public-private efforts to identify, plan, implement longer-term risk and vulnerability reduction strategies, and really take a look at accounting for all potential community impacts, such as health. In summary, our study addresses the lack of standard, quantifiable readiness and performance metrics, the lack of a clear framework for waiving regulatory and other requirements, the need for more flexibility in waiver and credentialing policies for essential response missions, and the need for more cost avoidance and additional communication between public and private sector entities. Finally, we talk a little bit about better incentives for small businesses to prepare effectively for natural disasters. Now, I know what I've just presented to you is a lot to take in. It's a mouthful. Um, again, I refer you to the executive summary in the report. Uh, hopefully, in table format, it's a little bit easier to understand than, than hearing me now. Um, but right now, I would like to turn to Ms. Robin Barnes for her perspective. Um, she just came in from Louisiana earlier today, and uh, she may have a, a little bit of insight to offer. So over to you, Robin. Okay. I am what has been known as a disaster recovery professional, though I am beginning to try out disaster resilience professional in light of the new paradigm of recovery that has been evolving over the last few years. My own experience with disasters dates back to 9-11, um, after which I ran a small business recovery program in lower Manhattan. Um, it also includes several hurricanes in Louisiana, including Katrina, the BP oil spill, and most recently, Hurricane Sandy, when I worked on the, Sa the Sandy Task Force in 2013 with some agencies represented here today and some individuals. Hi, Scott. 
Currently, my work revolves around creating an economic framework for coastal restoration, water management, and resilience activities, all of which are occupying a great deal of our time in the New Orleans area. Disasters not only wreak havoc on communities, but also on economies, local, national, and even global. The supply and price of gasoline at the pumps and crude oil prices and petroleum futures on Wall Street are impacted every time a named storm enters the Gulf of Mexico, the source of about 40 percent of this country's energy supply. The ripple effect of all of that up and down supply chains is stunning, impacting small businesses, jobs, and even the homeland security. And yet it has been my experience that economic development has been the afterthought of disaster recovery when it comes to the allocation of federal resources and attention. To be sure, it is critical that emergency responders and resources be directed to the provision of food, shelter, safety in the most expedient way possible. And this is not to say that resources have not been directed to economic recovery after disasters, but usually that has been the result of lots and lots of advocacy. EDA, for example, Economic Development Administration, did not get an allocation in the Hurricane Sandy um, bill. It is imperative that the economy be addressed concurrent with rebuilding infrastructure and housing, <clears throat> and that resources are aligned for maximum impact. Assessing what sectors were impacted and what opportunities may stem from the disaster can prove, prove, prove fruitful, inform recovery, and most importantly for today's discussion, build resilience. Here are just a few things to consider in terms of investments in economic recovery, all of which are things we have been able to do or continue to do in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Taking steps to diversify the local economy so that when disasters or other market shocks occur, business activity remains, even though some sectors may be temporarily offline. Aligning transportation and infrastructure repairs with regional economies, acknowledging that people sometimes live and work in different places and need to be able to get back and forth building local capacity of firms and workforce to rebuild and supporting innovation so that local specializations can be developed and exported. Supporting entrepreneurship because not all businesses are able to rebound and may need to be replaced. Investing in economic assets that can generate revenues and jobs for generations to come. And ensuring that everyone participate in and benefit from recovery. More recently, investing in green infrastructure, ecosystem restoration, and a more integrated approach to flood and subsidence mitigation and adaptation. These are all things that are critical to an economic um, recovery. These are the sorts of things we have been able to do in New Orleans or are working on utilizing federal resources from HUD to DOT to economic development, administration, and more. But this list is pretty universal and applicable to all areas vulnerable to disasters. The business sector is an integral part to recovery, not only as a recipient of small business loans, for example, or the implementer of rebuilding contracts, but also as a potential innovator and partner. There are, lots, there are not a lot of avenues other than through contracts where businesses can engage in recovery, and I think that is too bad, which is why some of the recommendations around public-private partnerships are really important. Before I end, I want to talk a little bit about two ways in which we are engaging businesses in the long-term resilience of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. The first is the creation of the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan, a resilient study and vision for the region for living with water, that stormwater, groundwater, rather than simply pumping it out of the city. This will help keep us resilient. This $2.5 million plan was funded by Hurricane Gusoff CDBG Disaster Recovery Funds. Our state had the foresight to think about resilience back in 2008 after Hurricane Gustav and set up a $10 million community resilience fund um, from which we were able to develop this plan. But instead of engaging only scientists and researchers, we procured a team of Dutch and American water industry leaders, including engineers, architects and designers, urban planners, landscape architects, along with the research institutions and other experts, so that the plan would be relevant in both theory and practice. Of note, we documented the economic benefits of implementing this plan. A conservative investment of $6.2 billion would have benefits and impacts totaling more than $20 billion in reductions of damage from flooding and subsidence, increased property value, lower flood insurance premiums, and job creation. Sounds like a good investment. The next example is the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan, a $50 billion plan for achieving real land gain over the next 50 years along our coast. 
This plan has been legislated, and a portion of the funding will come from the Restore Act, thanks to Senator Mary Landrieu and the rest of our terrific federal delegation, as well as uh, delegations from around the country that supported this. Because the voice of the private sector has been absent in advocacy for coastal restoration in Louisiana, we created the Coalition for Coastal Resilience and Economy, which consists of business leaders, bankers, lawyers, CEOs of manufacturing companies, and other business leaders who insist that coastal restoration is economic development and must occur in order to protect our economy. Moreover, it can provide great economic opportunity as well. My friend Dale Morris from the Dutch Embassy is here. He's the one who told me about how when government can partner with academia and private sector, innovation can be born. In the Netherlands, they generate at least 4% of their GDP from water management, including exporting services and technology. And who wouldn't want a little bit of that? Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Bob? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Nice to see so many people here today. Uh, Stephanie, thanks very much for this um, wonderful report. I know you all and your team worked very hard on it for a long time, so thank you very much. There's a lot of um, thought-provoking uh, thought um, information in it. And uh, I'm sorry that Lori Bertman's not here. Lori is the president of the Pennington Foundation and uh, also one of the founders of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. So hopefully she'll make it before um, the end of the session. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, the Center for Disaster Philanthropy was founded a few years ago. We came out of the Katrina experience, uh, and our founders were all major funders of activities, and they recognized the fact that um, the philanthropic response to uh, Katrina, like it is to most disasters, was very ad hoc, very reactive, and they were bombarded with phone calls from foundations and corporations who wanted to do something but didn't know what to do. And this is not surprising because if you were to ask um, most foundations and certainly most corporations if they're disaster philanthropists, they would say, well, no, not really. We fund programs for children or for the environment. Uh, and our disaster granting is just a very, very small portion of what we do. So they, they don't always have the experience, they don't always know what to do, and as a result, um, funding, uh, for the most part, from foundations, and I'm going to talk about some, some notable exceptions to that, uh, tends to be uh, reactive. Ninety percent of all dollars given to disasters is given within 90 days uh, of a disaster occurring. And I'm actually right now doing quite a bit of work with the media on Ebola, and one of the issues with the Ebola crisis is there's not an event. Uh, that um, captures uh, media attention. It's a slow evolving um, event that has occurred over many months and you could argue years. So I thought what I would start is by, um, first of all, um, saying something I really like about the report and that's the emphasis on whole communities. I think that's really important um, and that hasn't always been the case, um, but when we think of a whole community, we wanna make sure that uh, government, uh, private sector uh, is thinking about um, how to partner with private philanthropy. Uh, we've just uh, helped to fund a major report uh, that was just released on funding around Sandy. And um, this is a report uh, done by the Foundation Center. One of our partners was Philanthropy New York um, and the New Jersey uh, uh, Council of New Jersey grant makers. So all the major funders in the metropolitan area of New York. Um, you probably know some of these statistics. Sixty billion dollars came fr uh, from the federal government there or thereabouts. Um, almost 19 billion dollars in private insurance. Um, and then about 329 million from foundations and corporations. Now this is not including individuals, which was a, also a significant amount, but I'm going to um, center my remarks on institutional givers. So you could say 329 million, that's either not very much or that's a lot, uh, depending on what your perspective is. And I'm gonna say it's a lot um, in this case. It came from, um, from about um, 600 foundations and corporations and other institutional donors. Um, and to me, the point I wanna emphasize here is where did it go? With 60 billion coming from the federal government, with 
uh, nearly 19 billion coming from insurance, what could foundations do? Uh, and what foundations like to do, corporate uh, foundations as well, is find the gaps, find the areas that aren't being funded by others. And in this case, of that 300 uh, plus million dollars, about 65% of it went to human service organizations. Um, so these are the humanitarian needs of vulnerable populations. Um, I think our statistic I remember is 50% of all public housing is in, uh, uh, located in a floodplain in the New York City area. So vulnerable populations covers a lot of folks. Um, and another 10% um, went, and you'll be glad to hear this, Robin, went to economic and community development organizations. And you were probably had your hand in, in, uh, in spending some of that money. And then 5% went to federated organizations. So that's an interesting data point for us to be thinking about as we, um, as we consider this whole issue of, of private philanthropy. I wanted to also mention an article that just happened today in, in the Washington Post, and this is about it's entitled, In Ebola Fight, Private Foundations Provide Critical Financial Aid. And it's centered on the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, um, which has a foundation, the CDC Foundation. And it uh, recently received um, millions of dollars in contributions from, um, well-known contributions from Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, from Microsoft founders Bill Gates, and from Paul Allen. Um, within hours of receiving the money, the organization was authorized um, for staff to make repairs uh, to equipment that was necessary to provide um, um, assistance. And within the week, it was able to order, pay for, and ship to the region about 200 additional pickup trucks and four-wheel drive cars uh, worth $5 million. The unpredictable, and here's a quote, um, Stephanie, that should have been in your report. The unpredictable nature of the Ebola virus has made the government's partnerships with private donors critically important in the crisis response. Working outside the politically charged federal appropriations process and the sometimes sluggish bureaucracy, foundations and private individuals have been able to offer much needed relief for those on the front lines. Um, one of the workers said the unexpected needs, big and small, came up nearly every day. Motorcycles to, to deliver supplies through narrow roads, baby formula, data entry staffers. There would not have been an obvious second way to do it without foundation support. And then finally, this quote from Paul Allen's foundation. Hours, literally hours, um, uh, after their question, we were able to respond. One of the first organizations to donate money was the Paul Allen Foundation. In the case of this humanitarian crisis, we knew how important it was to get the money out quickly. So when we talk about private philanthropy, even though it's not uh, nearly, um, not always the same amount, it's money that can be um, uh, offered quickly um, with less bureaucracy, uh, can be more targeted, can focus on the social humanitarian issues and vulnerable populations, and can be flexible. So that's the um, first thing I just wanted to mention about uh, thinking about um, the role, sometimes not major amounts of money, um, but the role that private philanthropy can, think, uh, can play in this whole community. A second part uh, that we also uh, liked about the report and like about this thought of whole community is how the executive branch and private philanthropy um, have made considerable strides in the, their ability to work together in the intervening nine years since Katrina. A couple of examples um, that we um, have noted is the growing and expanding relationship between FEMA, HUD, Homeland Security, and other executive branch offices and private philanthropy. The creation of the National Business Emergency Operations Center. Um, the creation of the FEMA Private Sector Division. Uh, in 2007, and the creation of the Center for International Disaster Information. And that, that the CD provides resources and conducts public awareness activities designed to empower donors to help people affected by disaster. Or so I think since um, Katrina, we've begun to see some recognition um, of communication, but there's still many bridges to be built and a long ways to go. Conversely, the private philanthropy sector, um, is, uh, which was previously uh, accustomed to operating in a vacuum, now views the executive branch as both a resource as well as a partner of a disaster. And we're pleased to see 
uh, USG representatives at the national VOAD conferences, for example, something we didn't see a long time ago. I held a, I, um, I, I was the moderator of a panel uh, about six months or so ago of uh, Katrina funders, uh, and I asked them what was the biggest lesson you learned, and they said we didn't do we we have not established strong relationships with municipal and state governments. Um, and foundations often tend to think, you know, um, our, we can do whatever we want with our money and it can be used in any way we want. And what they realized after Sandy was for them to accomplish some of their goals, they needed to go through um, government layers to, um, to get zoning approved, to get uh, new construction plans, uh, to engage in civic engagement, to uh, kind of repurpose how their communities would operate. Uh, and I think it's a lesson from Sandy that we're going to hear more of from the foundation community. They must establish stronger relationships with local, state, and, and federal government. Finally, I just want to mention something about the, um, the full life cycle. Um, I mentioned in my opening statement that uh, so much of disaster philanthropy dollars is reactive, and we're trying to get donors to focus on the full life cycle. Um, it's, uh, I think, one of the um, uh, benefits, one of the side results of Katrina was, or I'm sorry, of Sandy, was for the first time we began to hear governors um, and and um, mayors in the New York metropolitan area begin to utter the word mitigation. Um, and we're now hearing quite a bit of that, uh, and we're hearing the press talk about it as well. Uh, and so our effort is to try to get donors to think about planning, about preparation, uh, mitigation, as well as the long-term recovery. And just a couple of, um, and so one quote from this report, philanthropic organizations can prove especially important in the long-term planning and recovery phases due to their ability to pool private funding and act independently of election cycles. A couple of examples of that, we're working right now with 10 states in the um, upper Midwest and working with 18 community foundations. And the whole effort of that work is around helping community foundations become community leaders in planning and preparation um, for disasters. We also just recently announced um, an early recovery fund that will now operate um, in the Midwest where we have accumulated some funds that we will use um, uh, when disasters occur um, for early recovery type work. Another recognition from a private foundation that um, we need to be thinking um, of the full life cycle. Uh, and then of course we're all familiar with um, Rock, the Rock, Rockefeller partnership with both HUD and USAID to build more um, resilient communities. So I'll stop here for now, um, but I just want to re uh, say once again uh, three, I think, three key concepts that uh, really resonated with us. One is a concept of the whole community, getting everybody involved. The second is a full life cycle, making sure that we're talking not just about emergency relief in those few days when the cameras are trained on the situation, but the full life cycle of disasters, which is so important. And then finally, to not forget about the importance of building social capital um, within our communities uh, to make them um, more resilient and, and better able to bounce back uh, when disaster does occur. Thanks very much. Thanks, both of you. Um, They've both mentioned Lori Bertman, who is the um, president and CEO of the Pennington Family Foundation. And she was the one who came to us at CSIS uh, several years ago to talk about what we as a think tank here in DC could contribute to the dialogue um, regarding natural disasters writ large. But we really here have focused on community resilience um, because we thought that was an area where that was sort of crying out for um, a little bit of attention here in DC it was receiving attention in communities that were struck by natural disasters. Um, as you know, small businesses don't return um, necessarily in the aftermath of a disaster. They, they maybe decide to move on. Some businesses do decide to return and, and having the structures and the support and the culture of support in place for them um, to do so was important. And so as a think tank here in DC, 
CSI has really, with the support of the Pennington Family Foundation, started to explore this area a couple of years ago. Areas that Lori, in particular, wanted us to focus on were how do you have a robust dialogue um, in this space, bringing together folks from the philanthropic community, from the for-profit private sector, such as Walmart, the big package stores, um, um, which means something different in Massachusetts now that I think about it, not that kind of package <laughs> store, um, but uh, not, not one that sells alcohol, um, but, uh, but big package stores, the think tank, the nonprofit community, the, the public uh, element of this all with um, DHS, with FEMA then falling under DHS uh, in the last decade or so. And so having this dialogue so that you can, that you can create these relationships that you can then call on in the lead up to during and in the aftermath of a natural disaster, and not only have dialogue for dialogue's sake, but turning then to implementation of recommendations, turning then to real ways that you could help either infrastructure or insurance, um, things that are not sexy, things that don't grab the headlines, things like insurance, things like um, small business loans, um, um, real concrete steps. And so if you take a look at a report, I welcome any feedback that you all have on it. Um, and I'm gonna take just one brief um, period right here and ask the first question, and then I will turn it over to the audience. Um, but the first question that I have is, uh, goes to Robin, which is, as a, as a member of the um, Sandy Task Force, um, you mentioned um, the importance of diversifying local economies, um, which is so many times easier said than done. Um, when you take a look at what the task force was charged with and sort of the, the ideas that were recommended for further action. Can you talk a little bit about reforms that might be needed in the short term, and then things that we mentioned uh, before coming out here, the long game. What are, what are things that we can tee up now to help continue this conversation and make sort of the cultural shifts, the longer, the longer term vision of the changes that are so necessary? The, um, I, I wrote the chapter on small business recommendations for the, um, the task force, and it was uh, supporting small businesses and revitalizing local economies. And a number of the recommendations focused on how to make um, contracts for recovery more accessible to small and local businesses, and how to uh, have your workforce ready to um, be able to take on that work. And I think this is directly related to diversifying your economy because, in fact, this work can be part of your economy. New Jersey actually added disaster recovery to its list of target sectors um, for their Department of Labor um, programs, and thereby acknowledging that disaster recovery was actually a sector. Uh, in New Orleans, we've actually created a sector called Emerging Environmental, which is um, a cluster of companies that addresses environmental challenges related to energy, waste, and water. So part of the diversity can actually be right in the disaster itself and um, addressing those challenges and actually developing that the specialization and the capacity to take on that work. Any thoughts on that, Bob? Well, um, I guess two. Um, I gave it, um, a presentation recently in Sarasota, Florida, and we raised, uh, we asked, I, I asked uh, who's been in a major disaster? And you would think in a place like Sarasota, Florida, everybody would raise their hand. And um, I'd say only about a third of the people did. Um, and the reason was of uh, the change in population, um, the in-migration still occurring in a place like Florida. Um, I asked how um, and since it's been many years since a, a major hurricane in Florida, I asked um, uh, if the organizations had a, had a planning document of some kind. And there got a lot of puzzled looks, and very few organizations were able to say anything. In part, I think, because of the big turnover of, of people. And it pointed out, once again, um, the need to uh, continuously um, refreshing uh, our, our planning and preparation activity and to get, uh, again, to make it a whole community activity um, to, get, um, to get everybody in, involved in it. Um, and, I, you know, I think this is an area, again, um, where I, th I think uh, private foundations are eager to play a role in the convening uh, activity. But it's gonna take something like that um, 
uh, and I think often small businesses and corporations, to my second point, can be one of the, um, the, the catalysts for that because we're seeing growing recognition among corporations that they need to be mindful of their supply chain. Um, they need to be much more mindful of their, their risks. Um, and um, so we're starting to hear much more sophisticated presentations from corporate, particularly from large corporations about um, the siting of their plants, um, about um, what kinds of uh, plans their vendors have, uh, about transportation issues, um, a whole uh, about uh, the safety of their employees in times of disaster. Uh, and so I think that kind of awareness about disasters and the planning for disasters is something that um, the whole community can benefit from. I'd like to turn it over to the floor. Uh, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask our panelists, I ask that you um, stand, uh, wait for the microphone that will magically appear by your elbow. Um, state your name, your affiliation if you have one, and then if you could ask a question, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, first up is the lady in the back. My name is Pat Cleveland. I'm a faculty member at the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland, just up the road. And I am really thrilled that you are having this session today. I appreciate so much that you are addressing these issues from the interface between government, business, and the community. I had the pleasure for the last three years of teaching an undergraduate course in business continuity management and emergency management to our business majors. and following exactly the epiphany that you all are articulating, that it is both their uh, needs that come to fore when a disaster hits uh, and, and thinking about mitigation, but there are assets that the business community can bring to bear. And so that's the kind of all hazards approach that we've been taking at the Smith School. I've also been working in the space with our corporate partners, and kind of their responses have been very interesting all over the map. Um, and so I am getting to my question, I promise. Um, in talking with them about what do you do in terms of preparedness, you know, it's way too late to start with mitigation. Uh, if you really begin by conceiving the business issues that are involved uh, in protecting your assets and your people, um, why is there not more engagement from the private sector? And the answer that I have been getting is, well, we have insurance for that. Well, we have a special you know, group here that they deal with disasters when disasters come, but there wasn't anything really strategic. So my question to the panel is, um, the people that you are working with in the philanthropic space, are they from the foundations and the philanthropic arms of these private sector entities, or are they separate from that? And is there a role that the foundations for, you know, consulting firms and other firms uh, can really play uh, in this interface here. Thank you. Uh, tough question to answer in terms of where they're coming from. Um, I, th uh, I think there's, um, uh, this is a gross generalization, but most f corporate foundation money tends again to be short term in perspective. Uh, and it's driven by um, um, by employee needs, uh, a need to get employees involved, a need for employees to match contributions, a need for um, th their th their corporate community to feel like they're doing something when a disaster occurs. And it's a little hard to get credit um, or to put emblazon your name on a, a planning effort for something that may or may not happen 10 years from now. Um, so that's, I think, part of the, the challenge of, of this. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we find our best uh, opportunities for partnership are with the risk assessment uh, organizations, those who have to think about continuity, those who have to think about what does our business do if there is a disaster. So I think you have to kind of segment it a little bit and, and find your partners for different types of activities. I've actually seen a lot of um, progress, um, probably going back to since 9-11, which I don't really know why, but for some reason it seemed to put small businesses on the map in terms of philanthropy and um, focus, and I think a lot of that has to do with small businesses now have been documented to employing, I can't remember, 60% of low-wage workers in the country. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but it's pretty significant. 
And so, so on the one hand, there's sort of the, the government support through SBA, the Small Business Development Centers, which now actually do have a lot of business continuity programs. But also there are some large scale initiatives with Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, J.P. Morgan Chase has a focus on small businesses. So I think there, and that is very much, you know, from my perspective, a good business model for them <laughs> because that's about protecting also their own interests. So I think that's kind of when it, it starts to work is when you, you sort of have companies sort of seeing that by protecting their own interests, there's a gain and small businesses are critical uh, to their supply chain. Thank you. There's a gentleman in the back, please. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Are you able to use the internet to get people together and get the funding together and get agreements on these projects? Bob? I'm not sure I understood what you were... Uh, Can we? Sure. Uh, are you speaking about during disasters or? In preparation. Oh, in preparation. Uh, it's sometimes that works. Um, I, I think uh, the effort usually is to start off with um, in-person meetings uh, to try to build rapport, build a relationship. Um, I think over time, once those those bonds have been created, um, using media, multimedia becomes a, a, a more effective tool. If I could just add to that, in, in conducting the interviews um, for this study, we talked a lot to folks about crowdsourcing. And, um, you know, when, in the era of Kickstarter and all of those, um, you know, what, what draws the attention of, of the folks who would participate in that kind of forum? And it ends up that a lot of times crowdsourcing is really good for situational awareness on the ground during a disaster and in the aftermath of it. But talking about what Bob has talked about, the planning, um, sort of the deliberate approach in, in advance of a disaster, it appears that crowdsourcing is not as useful as it could be. This is one of the areas where I think you could focus some attention uh, for improving, um, but again, currently, um, and probably in the immediate future, crowdsourcing seems to be good during and in the immediate aftermath. There's potential for, for advanced work to be done. But I think, um, as Bob was saying, it, it just, it's trying to grab an attention for, of people for an eventuality that may not occur. Um, and so it's very hard to get interest levels. I, I, am I mischaracterizing that at all? Okay. Thank you for, for agreeing with me. Um, this gentleman up here. Uh, Leo Bosner with the International Institute of Global Resilience, a very small nonprofit to work with Japan since the uh, 2011 disaster. Mr. Odenoff, could you talk a little bit more about how to get the donor community more involved in that full cycle of emergency management? You said 90% of the money is given within 90 days. Do you have any ideas on how to get that spread out a little bit further for the other uh, phases? Thank you. Uh, welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, uh, so a lot of our efforts go into educate and inform. Um, uh, I think you know this from your own experience in Japan. Um, it's much easier to talk to a donor who has been through a disaster. Uh, and so um, we're finding, um, of course, this has always been true um, in places like Louisiana where we can we can talk to Lori Bertman at the Pennington Foundation uh, because she's been through uh, a, a disaster or sometimes um, those donors in Florida. Um, but um, now we hear donors in New Jersey and New York um, who are um, much more aware of what we're talking about when we talk about planning and preparation. It really takes, um, I guess I would say there's three things. One is it takes a, um, an experience uh, that people can relate to. But two, then it takes some leaders, some determined leaders within a community um, who are willing to, to be the leader. Um, I mentioned our experience now in the Midwest um, where we're working with 18 community found foundations. It took uh, a determined foundation and a group of leaders. Um, and then finally, it takes a, um, um, I think a, um, a, 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 a convener, um, a, um, 
an organization who's willing to stick with it, um, who's willing to um, uh, uh, organize all those uh, difficult meetings, who's willing to stick with it for several years, uh, and then to um, continue to refresh it. Um, because so often these, uh, these efforts result in a, a, a brilliant report um, that gets everybody excited for a year or so uh, and then is uh, quickly forgotten. Uh, there was a quote uh, about um, uh, Ebola that was in the New Yorker last week that I remember. Um, and uh, the writer, Michael Spector was the writer, uh, said, um, our approach to pandemics is um, um, first we get frightened, then we forget. Uh, and that's going to happen with disasters unless there's somebody there who can, uh, you know, continually involve the community. Not an easy task. Thanks. We have time for two more quick questions. So, um, Gabriel, if you can come and, and this young lady in the, in the front and then um, here, uh, this young lady here up in the front and the gentleman in the purple. Hello, thank you for calling me young lady. I'm 63 years old. <laughs> anyway, I'm um, Annie Kayaban Wilderman. As I said this morning, I am a product of USAID, Government of the Philippines Training. And this report is very nice, and I would like your permission to baseline. We will, I will do it in the Philippines. And my question is under methodology, because as a planner, develop, in development planner, we always joke about those ivory tower planners, okay? And that triggered me to really live with scavengers when I had a scavenging program, okay? So my question is, just a quick glance of this book under methodology. Uh, I think it's implied that when you say local government, the local governments represent what our constituency <laughs> want. And also, I like the term whole of community. I ask that because I just retired from the Navy. My expertise is facilities and housing oversight. I was sent to Katrina during the storm, and it was very humbling. And I saw, especially within my Filipino constituents, those Filipinos who are not even US citizens, who lived in our housing communities. I could not get them to move to the hotels that we rented, you know. They said, Mom, it's okay. We owe the Navy. We will clean up. We will not wait for the government. And that is the kind of involvement I have seen. I beg and I encourage you to Google Olongapu City the city right outside of the Yusubic Naval Base, where you see the most amazing partnership between the US Navy or the US Armed Forces. And my friends who taught me there, who are now admirals, retired admirals, were going back to the Philippines to show the world what the face of the United States is. I, thank you for your perspective. I think um, it, it's, as Robin was saying, sometimes you know you, you can you can study a particular disaster, in, the, in her case, Sandy, um, and then take it and, and apply the recommendations in, in a much broader context. So thank you for, for sharing your experience. Uh, Gabriel, if we can just, this, I'll call him a young man in the front row. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rafi. I'm an MPA grad of University of Love with a focus of disaster management. So my question is about, uh, you mentioned about the uh, challenges that uh, private sector uh, or business institution face when they want to help uh, government or pri uh, local government. How about the other uh, non-business institutions such as uh, religious institution? Do they face similar challenges uh, when they encounter with municipal or other uh, city governments? Uh, uh, this is my first question. Uh, my second question about the, uh, you, uh, we all just, you discussed about the, the issues that's going in, in the United, inside the United States. How about the, uh, uh, how about the other countries, uh, how they cooperate? You mentioned about the Netherlands. How about uh, other European countries? Uh, uh, could the United States learn from them uh, which, which best practice it could be brought to the United States? 
Thank you very much. Uh, for the first question, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Bob to, to look at sort of the, the non-for-profit um, uh, private sector folks, the, the religious entities. And then if I could turn to both of you just to, to briefly touch on if you've worked with um, colleagues in the international arena, and, and if so, what countries they might have hailed from. So faith-based organizations are very important um, to disaster relief uh, and play a major role. Um, and um, um, uh, you know, our country really couldn't do without um, the role of, of faith-based organizations in the immediate disaster relief. Um, it's sometimes a challenge uh, to coordinate all their activities, uh, and uh, it tends to, uh, the activity tends to focus primarily on um, the immediate relief. Um, what I think uh, we need to do in partnership with government is, is find more intentional ap approaches uh, that covers, as we've been talking about, about planning and preparation, and then uh, find organizations who have the resources um, for the long term of the recovery rebuilding. And I think that's an area where we still need more work to, there's still more work that needs to be done in, in a, in a public-private partnership. Well, on the international piece, um, uh, we certainly see a role of, of private philanthropy. Um, 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 not as much uh, as we see domestically, um, although we're seeing on Ebola, for example, there's been over $350 million uh, donated in just the last few weeks by some of those major philanthropists um, like Gates and Paul Allen and Zuckerberg and, and now uh, Google. Um, so it does happen, um, but it, it tends to be a little less. There's certainly the large NGOs who play a very important role, uh, and in some ways um, are more organized to do the full life cycle of disasters. So you're seeing more activity in planning, more activity in recovery, sometimes than you even see here domestically. And of course, government plays such a huge role on the international front and multinational corporations, organizations. I was actually gonna also comment on the large NGOs that um, I know after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of the NGOs that focused on refugees and, and relocation and, and a whole host of um, issues overseas actually came to New Orleans because some of those things were playing out yeah. um, in New Orleans. But in terms of, I, I think sort of the sharing is very ad hoc. Um, from what I can tell, you know, we've had lots of delegations. I have not been a part of them from New Orleans that have gone to Haiti, that have gone to Japan. It sort of depends on, you know, somebody you know, somebody's doing the inviting, it's a university or something like that. And so there's, there's been sharing. I don't know that it's been formalized in any way. Well, thank you. Um, before I thank uh, the panelists, I, I would like to call everyone's attention. Um, to a, a mentor of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program at CSIS. We've mentioned her earlier. Um, I, I said that she was the president and CEO of the Pennington Family Foundation. Bob mentioned that she was a co-founder of his organization, the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. And I believe she is um, probably one of the foremost experts that I've met um, and even heard about uh, in this uh, field of talking about disaster giving. Um, so Ms. Lori Bertman has joined us. Um, uh, true to form with our dis natural disaster series, um, we, her, her participation was delayed by weather. Um, and so, Lori, thank you so much for your leadership, um, for your encouragement, and for really um, encouraging us here at CSIS to take a fresh eye, a set of eyes to this space, um, and for being such a, a great supporter of our organization. So, uh, Ms. Lori Bertman, and please uh, join us in thanking our, um, our panelists. And thank you all for joining us on such a dreary day. Have a good one. <laughs>